Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts explore insights that the data reveal to fuel disruption and market growth for CPG, retail, healthcare, and media industries. I'm your host, Tanya Shakart, coming to you from my home office in Southern California. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on another episode of IRI Growth Insights. And I'd like to welcome back Senior Vice President, Omnichannel Media Center of Excellence, Jennifer Polino. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Tanya. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Glad to be back. Yes. Glad to have you. I'm so excited about this series, this weekly opportunity to chat with you. Um, So, okay, for our listeners, this podcast is going to be the second in a series um, around how to advertise through a pandemic. And for our listeners, if you haven't had a chance to um, to hear that first one, it aired April 15th, so you can find it on our website. Um, there's some great insights around the state of the industry, pantry loading, um, some trends that IRI is seeing and consumption patterns, how consumers are returning to comfort brands, and what all of that means for advertisers. But today, we're going to continue the conversation um, with a quick lesson, if you will, um, you know, I know it's it's sort of daunting to even think about um, about advertising right now, but um, you know, there's concerns around it. I know, um, you know, costs. But are there lessons from past crises and strategies that we learned in history um, for advertisers? Um, what can they learn from the past, essentially? Yes, I think it's a really good question. I mean, as we currently see today, we're getting a lot of questions and asks about, should I even advertise? And why should I advertise um, today? So it's a, it's a tough question. But what we know is that it's so important. Um, first, to make sure that we retain consumers' ability, right, to remember your brand and to keep it top of mind. There, you know, there's this um, mental space now <laughs> that they have uh, to understand your brand and to, uh, you know, be more connected to it. So it's important to think about, uh, you know, what state people are in and their ability to learn and gain information and connect with your brand in a different way during these particular times and how you message them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are trying products that they haven't tried before. Um, We've seen, and I mentioned it last week, we've seen a lot of new brands or older traditional brands have a lot more new customers coming Mm -hmm. into their, into their fold and you want to basically retain them. And so you want to work hard to maintain that, um, uh, mental ability while you have them getting their physical physical product off the shelf, right? Active audience, literally, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, the, the next message is, well, okay, that makes a little bit of sense to me, but what's actually happening, you know, can I afford it, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, during these times of difficulty and in recession. And right now what we are seeing is that advertising, um, is decreasing the the actual CPMs or the ability to the, the, the costs are lower to actually get into some of the the media vehicles mainly because there's a lot of you know it's a excess a little bit excess supply although right. consumption is there and so it's you know taking advantage of the ability that you have new consumers and you have the you have the ability to capture more of their head and their heart yeah. and also to um, lining that up with you know taking advantage of you know being able to maybe get a, a larger share of voice um, and we see a lot of this we do see this pattern um, within other um, recessions and other time frames in history, mm-hmm. and we've we've done, and there's been some some research that shows that you know the it and it it underscores really the importance of why we need to continue to invest in advertising door during economic downturns, not only about the consumers, but you know brands that 
when we saw that they cut advertising, and um, we'll look at a we'll look at a few uh, specifics. But when they cut advertising, their sales um, obviously decrease. But mm. we see an increase in sales of those that you know over time, um, you know, not only increase during that you know difficult challenge, but also in um, in future time periods. Yeah, that's so, so ca- that's so counterintuitive, right? So it's I can't wait to hear about it because yeah. it's not what you would think. No, it isn't. It it isn't, right? So, um, you know, in past behavior, we see from brands that advertised, um, let's take a look at, you know, the least, go back a little bit more, um, uh, the 91 recession. Um, You know, this is where we had shock of, you know, immense oil pricing increases that had, you know, a lot of job losses um, overall and some, you know, for some brands, obviously a loss in confidence in the economy Mm -hmm. and therefore did not uh, participate and focus on advertising. And what we saw is that brands that actually cut advertising saw a decrease of about 25%. Um, But the brands that actually increased their advertising saw a better than comparable sales increase of, you know, up to, up to 60%. Wow. Um, in sales, and that you know, we also saw those same similar trends in uh, seventy four and in eighty one in those recessions as well. Um, and you know, if you look at a couple of um, you know closer to home uh, types of um, challenges, when uh, SARS um, right. the SARS crisis happened in about two thousand two two thousand three. Um, the world economy really suffered. It lost, you know, about $40 billion and it it certainly um, affected the businesses of leisure and travel and tourism and, uh, you know, you know, several different industries, right. That are all associated with it. And brands, again, that supported their brands during that time saw increases in their products um, up to 35% for overall sales. And not only during that time, but uh, they had a laggard effect, right? That it happened over one year later as well. Mm-hmm. So those brands that are capturing, as we had said before, that that ability, that share of voice um, and that mental um, availability um, of a consumer, you know, are prospering, not only, you know, it's a, it's a pay it forward type of strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, and then the last one, um, you know, the the one I think that's closest to us all that most of us remember was the 2008, the Great Recession, where right. we, we saw a overall brand media spend drop 15 percent and brands that actually maintained or increased their support and efforts. We saw sales grow upwards of 30 percent. Mm. And what I think is interesting here is now, and you think about those times and, um, you know, as history and the major communication yeah. of these brands was television, digital was kind of just getting, you know, digital was, was there in 2008, but it wasn't as personalized as it is today. And right. certainly in 2002 and 91 and, um, you know, during those recessions and going back 70, uh, 81 and 74, those times didn't have that ability to connect in the way that we can today. Right, right. With, with consumers. And so I think it's really important that, you know, we almost, I always say like, you know, doubling down on, yeah. <laughs> on yeah. your brand. And we talked a little bit about that last podcast, but it's so important to keep yourself top of mind um, because of those statistics and people will remember you right um, going forward. Yeah. 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 That, that speaks to the whole consumer behavior, you know, um, piece of it, doesn't it? Um, what, what were some, um, what were some of the strategies that, that came out of those learnings or can be applied now? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that we have to think about how you, um, how you employ, you know, bold growth strategies during (laughs) during this time and think about that. So obviously you have to understand what is happening with the behaviors of your consumers. Right. 
um, and understand, you know, what new behaviors are adopted and what new are what behaviors are temporary versus ones that will have that longer term effect. Right. And where you should be think uh, how you should be thinking of communicating. And the first one is certainly on messaging, making sure that we are fo- you're focused on the right types of messaging that you're um, connecting with your consumer. You're making sure that you're adjusting your marketing campaigns and you, and when that that time frame of when you're pushing your your marketing campaigns, right, right. Uh, so that you can you know, really speak to not only the right people, but at the the time in which that's going to be appropriate for to make the the most impact off of them. You really also too, you know, language is obviously super important, but the visuals and the imagery is absolutely important to make sure that you're getting in touch with your consumers and making sure that they are pushing the 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 pushing the the boundaries of what's appropriate in the marketplace now you don't want to feel tone deaf in your imagery or how people are interacting with each other um, but then you also have to be very you have to be very um, you can't have the you have to make sure that you can't capitalize right on right 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 you yeah can't that's, be that's an alarmist for sure yeah. yeah, you can't be an alarmist. You can't be, um, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, of opportunistically, you know, talking about sales or, you know, like a tactless message. Um, you need to make sure that you are making sure that you're informing people, um, but not being offensive right. off of it. And again, that goes to being positive without being um really negative, you know, being yeah. positive, not being ignorant from a standpoint of being too, too negative um, right. at, at that particular time. Right. And making sure that you can highlight how your brands can help. And those strategies on how your brands can help, we think about uh, those brands that did position themselves, you know, and help brands position themselves uh, during recession, what categories Um, you know, from past learnings that we've seen perform particularly well and why they perform perform particularly well. We see brands such as, um, you know, hair color and, um, you know, spices and seasonings and vitamins and soup and, um, you know, uh, perform, you know, during these post-recession times from our history. We've seen those perform quite well. And partly is because you think about, again, the behaviors, how people are thinking about that. They're going to do more things at home. They're thinking about value for money, right? Right. What is, um, you know, I I might not be able to afford to go to the hairdresser and color every, you know, month. I might have to uh, go and maybe every other month, Mm -hmm. but... So these are these are appropriate strategies that your brand has to think about. Yeah. Uh, so so it's not necessarily apples to apples, but the takeaways from some of those past crises can be applied here, right? I mean, in the in the recession, it was it was to your point, folks were money conscious instead of, you know, maybe going to the hairdresser every six weeks. Maybe they went once and then skipped one, did it themselves at home. So that's why there was an increase in those products. Um, whereas now it's 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 both, right? It's, it's a financial mm-hmm. in many cases uh, for many people. And also, um, you know, the physical restrictions that are being placed. Um, Correct. Yeah. Right, upon you. And you, you don't know when um, uh, you'll be able to, you know, go back to the hairdress or, right. or when you'll actually be able to get an appointment. I'm, uh-huh. <laughs> that's what I'm worrying about a little bit right now. How, how long <laughs> it's actually going to take. You do, I do not want to be cutting my own hair. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, but, but yes, so the, there's the portion of, you know, understanding what's important, how you talk to them. Then there's the portion of what types of brands and categories that we have yep. to think about to um, 
help during these recessionary times and new behaviors that are going to be happening. And then um, within your portfolio of your brand, you have to think if you have, um, you're in one category and you might have maybe several different brands, but you have to start thinking of, you know, flanker strategies where- Yeah, I love that. Have- I love that yeah. strategy. Let's let's dig into that a little bit. The flanker Yeah, you might have um, some higher brands, right? Like higher price brands and, you know, maybe some higher quality products or brands or benefits. And then you might have some, you know, lower ones and then like say a mid-tier product, I mean, within there. And so I think you have to start thinking about, well, which brand do I start supporting during this time? Right. Because I people might be willing in times of prosperity to pay, you know, an additional dollar, two dollars for um, a, you know, additional benefits um, but in these times where they have to watch their money, they might have, you know, people, that, their, their loved ones, um, you know, might be out of work um, or, you know, uh, times have been a cut back in ability to earn money. Mm-hmm. They have to, you know, watch and have a different strategy. And so while they still might need that particular product, they're willing to move towards um, a lower, um, maybe lower like maybe not a lower total quality, but remove some of the benefits. Yeah. So I start have to thinking about which benefits are really most important to individuals and thinking about what are your base, um, what are the base needs, right? Yeah, and, yeah like, we sort of talked about this in the last podcast, right? Around um, comfort, the comfort brands, but then we also talked about home, you know, food consumption is up. And so mm-hmm. when you have, you know, we're a family, like we talked about, we're a family of six teenagers. and two boys. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it, our choices, you know, have changed um, just because they're here eating nonstop. Um, right. So yeah, no, that's, right. that's good. So yeah. So that, that item assortment and making sure that you have the right as, uh, the right set of products within your brand portfolio, um, even as a, a marketer and making sure that you, you know, think about lower performing SKUs, Right. Where you might be able so that you can think about, you know, your profitability and how you're going to manage your overall portfolio. How do you maybe remove some of those lower performing SKUs and you start putting your production and you start putting your messaging uh, and your focus against, you know, brands that are best going to be able to meet that need. Right, right. So th- I think I, I read somewhere it was fighter brands. Um, launching in the same category as as an established brand um, and then having to decide to your earlier point, which ones you're going to put the focus on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so um, before we, um, before we switch on to a topic that I think marketers really appreciate, I, I, I wanted to, you mentioned something earlier about, um, you know, it's, it's advertising th- through a pandemic. So, you know, that implies that it's, it's, you know, during and then, and then after, and you mess, you mentioned that some of these, um, history lessons that, that, um, that we can take away, um, from in past crises extended beyond the crises, right? Long after the crises, um, brands saw increases in sales that continued mm-hmm. to advertise. And I, and I, it made me think about a piece of research I read recently, um, it was a Forster piece of research um, around consumer behaviors post World War One, and um, you know, as things started to recover, right in the Roaring Twenties, um, um, people eventually started to embrace the way they lived and worked, and and how technology helped to fuel that recovery. And and I just thought immediately of, of Zoom, how how popular that's become, and um, you know, I think it was sort of foreshadowing um, the things. Th- the things that we're hopeful for in terms of recovery through this pandemic. You know, I thought that was, well, that was interesting takeaway. Um, a very uh, poignant choice of, of wording, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I, this, I think it goes to a very similar type of question on, should I be advertising during these times? It's yeah. the same type of question. Should I be innovating during these times? Right. And my my answer to that is absolutely. Um, you know, we're always in a constant state of change, and 
crises seem to escalate that, right? The change happens um, much more rapidly uh, during that t- this, the, the time. And people have to adapt a little bit uh, differently and a little bit more quickly, uh, you know, for flexibility. And so I think that when you are evaluating also too how your brand is going to be viewed and how you market it and talk to people and invest in it. Part of that investment strategy is about innovation, right? What benefits that are going to be more appropriate, you know, going forward. So I think about, putting those all together. And if I just thought about, you know, something simple about like home cleaning products or even um, antibacterial products, Mm -hmm. the additional benefits of those, um, you know, if you can come up with something that's even more innovative about what, you know, people are going to be using, obviously, I think going forward, more hand sanitizer or types of hand sanitizer, you know, what other types of things can you, you know, innovate maybe around dispensing methods or, um, or uh, moisturization because you're, you know, the alcohol dries, you know, your, your skin out. Um, But, you know, are there ways to start innovating around those particular products? You know, if, that's your your category that you're focused on but even just for the regular cpgs right how do you right you know how do you make sure that you're bringing together what people's um how their what their state of mind is and what their new needs are in the marketplace so that's that's a great segue actually because you're talking about um you know the ability to adapt right? And that's going to help fuel recovery, right? Is we're going to have to adapt to this new reality, whatever that ends up being. And um, so so you talk about consumers adapting to it and you talk about marketers adapting, which then dovetails into agility, which I know is something that you're really big on and you think it's really important. So let's talk a little bit about, about agility because I know that that's, that's an important piece for you. It is. I... Um... And the reason why it is so important to me, and I, I just give you, a, I'm a, um, a blue chip marketer from way back when, and you see brands and, you know, companies get larger and it takes so long to think about moving and innovating. And, you know, there's always these mottos, fail fast, and then, but it, <laughs> it doesn't happen. And so, you know, in these times, as I said, you have to really think about, you know, how you can be not not just reactive, but reactive and proactive about you know how forward you can move yeah. and how quickly you can do that. Speed is you know uh, of utmost importance. I always I love this quote. I can't. I do not know who said it, but um, I'm sure we I can, we can figure that we'll out. We'll source but, it. We'll source it. Yeah, we'll have to find and source it. But it's uh, you know it, the quote is basically today is the slowest day of the rest of your life right. because you have to continue to get faster every single day, and the world around you is moving at you know record speeds, and so that just saying sticks with me and how quickly you have to be able to adapt and be flexible. And so you have to learn during these times. So we have past learnings. You have to apply those quickly, but also too, what are you learning today that can put you more in the future um, to be successful and I think about that and you think about you, what we're learning today and you think about artificial intelligence yep. and machine learning. And while, you know, a month ago, that is how we, you know, that was the forefront. That's where everybody was going. And yet that still is very important. But when you think about it, what is the underlying base? It's based off of a lot of predictability. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. And so we have to think about now, how do you uh, start coding and developing the right algorithms that are going to be helpful in the future that take into effect these unprecedented times that we're in today? Right. 
Yeah. What a great, so that's a great teaser, right. For our next podcast actually. Right. Which is, um, you know, what, how, and why would you measure, you know, during this time? Um, and to your point, it's because artificial intelligence only works when it's learning. So we have to be learning right now in order to apply those learnings later. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So tease up our next podcast for next week. I hope everybody tunes in. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much. Always so great to chat with you. Can't wait to do it again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Please visit iriworldwide.com to view the IRI COVID-19 dashboard and insights portal, where you'll have access to daily updates, in-depth reports, as well as observations and implications for the CPG retail industry. Please become a subscriber of IRI Growth Insights and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.